It's the After Show with Telecom TV's Guy Daniels and Ray LaMaitre. Yes, welcome to the After Show. It's day two of the Open Run Summit and we are live on Telecom TV. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and this is the second of two live Q&A shows. Indeed, it's the final programme of this year's summit. Today's panel discussion looked at hardware innovation for Open RAN deployments, including the all-important area of dedicated silicon. We've already received questions from you on this, and some of our panellists are back with us now to help answer them. But there is still time for you to send additional questions. However, you need to act fast. Use the Q&A form on the website. There's also a poll question, and we are asking you which of these are the most important areas of focus for the Open RAN community during the next 12 months. So go ahead and cast your vote now. Just select whichever ones you think are the most relevant, and we'll be looking at the results towards the end of the show. As always, your co-host for the after show is Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director at Telecom TV. Ray, we also heard today from the Open Networking Foundation about its vision for the path towards Open RAN deployments. Yeah, that's right, Guy. Uh, the ONF has been working on Open RAN developments for some time uh, and is now a year into its work with Deutsche Telekom and the potential of the RAN Intelligent Controller, or RIC, and the X apps that run on a near real-time RIC platform. Uh, the ONF's time on Sloan gave a detailed update on that relationship and what is going on with the ONF in general. It really is a hands-on open source outfit. And the RIC, I think, as we know, is a really hot topic in open RAN circles right now. Yeah, it certainly is. And now, of course, it's got to deliver. And I, for one, am looking forward to seeing how operators put the RIC to use. So much is happening in open RAN right now. OK, so let's meet our guests who are, as always, eager to help with all of your questions. Joining us live on the programme today are Andy Duncan, Open RAN RF and Digital Platform Development Manager at Vodafone. Don Hawkins, Director 5G Development with Dell Technologies. And Volker Ricker, Director Product Line Manager Open RAN at Comscope. Hello everybody, good to see you all again. Now we've got lots of audience questions to get through, so let's get going. Ray, do you have our first question? Guy, yes, I do. Thanks very much. And Andy, we're going to come to you uh, with this first question. Uh, and the question is, what is the planned lifetime for Open RAN as an ecosystem? And the person sending in the question says that uh, they believe this is particularly topical as 2G and 3G networks are being sunsetted uh, in the US market in particular. So uh, is there a particular sort of lifetime for, for Open RAN, how long it's going to be relevant? So for us, absolutely, that um, the, the view for Open RAN is that this is the technology to move forwards with. So there is no immediate um, time frame put around that apart from this is the future. This is the transition from proprietary um, RAN platforms to, to, to fully open platforms going forwards. And, and the reasons that we've, we've made this transition or in the process of making the transition has, has been about driving more cost-effective platforms, driving more innovation, broadening the ecosystem of of vendors. Um, so no, this is this for us um, is the future. So there, there is there is there is only a plan to continue and to deploy and and to expand the markets we deploy in. Now certainly in some regions, two um, G, three G um, certainly are being decommissioned. Certainly for Vodafone, our objective is for the open RAN platforms to support 2G, 4G, and 5G. Um, you know, 4G is very much the technology today, 5G significant deployments across the majority of markets. But without doubt, 2G is here still for the foreseeable future. We have many markets where the demands for that technology will exist for a good period of time. Um, and especially if we look into our AMAP region, 
you know, the low cost of devices for, for 2G is, is, is significant there and, and our markets are demanding 2G. So in able to, to successfully deploy open RAN, it has to support all technologies. We're, we're not looking at, at the capability really for 5G only overlays. That's not part of our strategy. So no strong demand for 2G, 4G, 5G coming from, from ourselves. Okay, excellent insight there, Andy. Thanks very much. And uh, Volker, you wanted to come in on this one as well. So, so Open RAN for me is a, an enhancement of 3GPP. So it, it doesn't matter which technology is uh, is below. So, so the the um, air interface uh, we are talking of it's it's more an enhancement. Looking into the interfacing and making them open open for other vendors than just uh, uh, one big OEM. And, and uh, we want to get over the uh, vendor lock-in uh, operators have today. Okay, thank you, Volker. Um, okay, so great question, uh, great answers there. Thanks very much, Guy. Like you said, we've got a lot to get through today. So let me hand back over to you for the next question. Yep, thanks, Ray. Um, and this next question, Obviously, coming from someone who's working at the heart of RAN. Uh, Don, let me address this one to you first. The question is, speaking as a RAN engineer, what plans are in place to ensure knowledge transfer as after deployment, we obviously need to operate these products? Hi, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so vendors absolutely will need to be able to support um, their solutions that they bring to market, and that'll include uh, the type of training the the question is referring to. So in Dell's case, we created the telecom systems business unit to bring um, Dell's experience and capability and scale to the telecom uh, industry. So we'll take that, that those learnings and, and that capability um, to include the type of training and, and uh, knowledge transfer that the question is referring to. And that involves working collaboratively with your customers and your partners to make sure that um, you're fully covered. So the operation of the RAN um, uh, goes smoothly. Yeah, th th thanks, Don. And, you know, it always seems to come back to, you know, this issue of collaboration. It, it's it's not just a supply and disappear. You know, it's an ongoing ongoing partnerships between operators and their, and their partners. And that includes knowledge transfer. Okay, well, uh, I don't think we uh, any of the comments on this particular question. So let me move it on and uh, hand it over to you again, Ray. Okay, thanks, Guy. Um, so Volker, we'll come to you first with this uh, next question. Um, and this comes from, I think we're pretty sure this comes from somebody uh, at a major network operator. And the question is, uh, Multi-RAT and band remote radio units are critical for upcoming open RAN markets, especially in dense areas. Does the panel have any expectations for commercial products and interoperability between different suppliers for these kind of radio units? And for example, where are we in terms of massive MIMO, massive MIMO radio unit availability for open RAN deployments? So uh, quite a, a detailed and in-depth question there. Uh, Volker, any insight on this at all? Yeah, I fully agree. We need uh, solutions for high dense traffic areas, urban areas where you typically have like eight carriers and the massive MIMO radio. So, so this is um, currently not implemented, and I'm expecting this in in 2024 uh, that that this technology is um, is available. But we are on a good track. Uh, we are seeing now um, the DU and CU software um, is starting to prepare for it. We see these hardware acceleration cards uh, being available, and because you need a lot of computation power. But, but also the DU and CU vendors, they need to concentrate on um, carry aggregation, dynamic spectrum sharing, all the nice features uh, you typically have in a, in a um, OEM's uh, system. And, and that, of course, also is needed uh, for, for the open run system. If you talk about hardware, um, we as Copscope, we have to develop a, a reference design in a split architecture where, where we split the massive MIMO radio into a 
um, um, a, a antenna and filter unit, antenna filter unit, and, and into the electronics parts, which which gives the opportunity to the chipset guys um, to to work towards this uh, reference design and and have this as a reference and, and try it out. And and it also fits into our um, mosaic platform where we could uh, combine passive and active uh, antennas into one antenna. So so you don't need to go um, with the FTD antenna. Um, um, and, and, and a different uh, TDD antenna. Okay, interesting. So it sounds like it's uh, uh, the catalyst for some uh, product innovation here as well in the open RAN space. Uh, Andy, we'll come to you next, and then Don will come to you. So uh, plenty of comments here for this question. So uh, Andy, what are your thoughts on this? So yeah, radio units is a fascinating and, and very well supported area, in fact, in terms of the open RAN hardware platform. Um, today we see a healthy catalogue um, of, of single band macro radios to support our, our intended deployment spectrum bands and, and deployment scenarios. So, so the single band products, that's where everybody started, makes a lot of sense. You build the knowledge and experience. Um, now, of course, being an operator, we're seldom set, satisfied by what we see in the roadmap. So we've been pushing our vendors hard for, for both dual and triple band macro radios to, to support those initial deployments. And, you know, technology has, has helped us with this. We've seen um, some recent um, releases of reference designs uh, and new silicon from, from some of the leading silicon vendors that will enable us to deliver those dual and triple band radios, probably starting to, to appear for, or ready for testing towards the end of this year. So certainly ready for commercial deployment next year. Um, so, so we're good with this area. We're still continuing to, to, to develop further reference designs to support our own plans for, for white box radio. So we're also looking at how we can um, leverage contract manufacturing and have radios built specifically to, to meet our applications as well. Um, and, and that way, bringing further competition to the market and more opportunities for people to get involved, both in terms of, of the design, but also the, the the, the delivery of the, of the components to meet our requirements in terms of PAs and, and filtering. So we're looking this way, the, to follow this path for, for manufacture really brings the opportunity for more innovation in the marketplace as well. So that's really exciting for us. Um, Vulcan knows how hard we're pushing in terms of, of massive MIMO. Um, it's still a technology, I mean, it might be not quite true to say it's, in, it's still in its infancy, but in terms of the level and type of products we need for commercial deployment, um, we're, we're, we're at a relatively early point in the journey. Again, this comes down to, to, to the products that we're starting to see in the roadmap, specific new drops of silicon coming through 2023. So I think that Volker's timeline for commercially ready products in 24, which will completely meet um, operator requirements and also importantly comply with all of the ORAN specifications and architectures in terms of how we choose to do um, more of the baseband processing how we implement some of the advanced beam steering um, type functionality are going to be quite critical. But back to one of the, the, the usual challenges for any operator is the products today at least still struggle in terms of the physical form factor, um, power efficiency, um, and then subsequently as well, just the cost. So a big focus is about ensuring the products are going to be uh, fit for purpose, but also economically viable to support widespread deployment. And, you know, we see not just our own plans, but many operators perhaps starting to look towards 2023 for these wide scale deployments. So, you know, typically you might start in, in, in more urban or even rural areas for the deployment. So then ramping up from that, if you start sort of 23, 24 with those commercial deployments, then into your dense urban areas where perhaps you're going to want more massive MIMO. The timelines, I think, are, are going to be suitable and, and something that we can certainly work with. Um, but as ever, you know, we need to get products into the lab and then into the field for some piloting um, as soon as possible. We can't take our foot off the gas in terms of massive MIMO development. But um, yeah, many aspects are, are looking very positive and, and it's great to see the support across the industry from many different vendors looking at how we can, can achieve our objectives. 
Okay, excellent. Well, that's all really encouraging. And it sounds like uh, lots of different efforts from lots of different parts of the industry are sort of uh, coming together, specs, hardware, testing, deployment plans for uh, around that uh, late 23, 24 timeframe. So uh, uh, great insights there. Thanks very much. Uh, and Don, from the, from the Dell perspective, what are you seeing in terms of demands from the market and, and the, the capability to the market to be able to deliver to these kind of you know, quite exacting uh, requirements that the operators are looking for? Yeah, well, I wanted to touch on, I'd follow on what Andy had said, uh, when you have these different vendors delivering radio radio units, you need to, when we have multi-vendor uh, scenarios, the front hall interface interoperability, um, we've seen already in our labs successful inter integrations between um, DU and, and, and the RU. And when you have collaborating uh, um, partners with the same goal in mind, that can be quite a successful um, partnership. But that really doesn't end there. To, one of the things I just wanted to bring up and the question about these different uh, vendors is you need to create a type of environment, a test environment to ensure continued compatibility and, and verification. So coming up with a, a very modern CI, CD, infrastructure in the lab environment to monitor and continue to evaluate um, upgrades in the as you could develop new features and capabilities in your solutions. So um, one of the things Dell's done is create the open telecom ecosystem lab, OTEL, to develop that type of modern uh, infrastructure. So that's another part that really is key for these multi-vendor um, deployments and solutions. Okay, excellent. Great point, uh, Don. Thanks for that. And uh, Andy, you wanted to just come back in there quickly. I did just to, to, to echo Don's comment really about the importance of, of the partnerships. Um, you know, we're, we're developing hugely complex and technical platforms. Partnerships is absolutely key. So many vendors, I think, that are making real advances in the technology today are, are quite often working together. And then when they bring something to the operator, it's much closer to, to, to being sort of ready for, for, for lab testing or further evaluation. And sometimes the operator can also act as the broker to bring other partners in to complete the product proposition. So from that point of view, you know, if, if, if there's small companies out there with innovative ideas but don't quite know how to, to, to get them into the marketplace because they're not quite bigger, Open RAN really gives us the opportunity to build some of those engagements, which is great. But, but back to this partnership point, the real success here as well. The really important thing I think for the industry going forward is that we maintain these partnerships also working really closely with with and engaged in the ORAN Alliance working groups. So much of what we want in order to achieve the open specifications for the platform um, is increasingly dependent on, on the ORAN specifications both being developed but also published in time that we can then have commercial products that follow the specifications. And, and as we get closer and closer to these commercial deployments, there's less and less time to perfect the specifications and get them right. So at the moment, um, we'd like to see, I think, acceleration in that area of, of ORAN, giving us the best possible chance to have, have these fully open, standardized products ready to go into to the marketplace. So it's important for, for all areas, be it the compute platform, be it the, the RU, but you know, it's super critical, I think, for Massive MIMO. We want to get those first products right. Um, inevitably they're going to be expensive and we can't afford not to or we can't afford to go back and swap them out. So it's really time, I think, for lots of people that perhaps at the moment aren't involved in the ORAN community um, in that standardization work and all the working groups there to, to really step up now and, and come and join us and, and help us complete this, this, this critical stage, I think, of, of open round development. Okay, excellent. Well, there you go. The invite is open to the industry. I mean, there's, there's no doubt, I think, in the past... Uh, a couple of years, even with COVID, the 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 amount of collaboration uh, there's been in the industry is is certainly something that we we've never seen before, and a, a greater willingness of companies to come together and, and work together, and uh, and these things are starting to to pay off now for sure. Uh, okay, great insights there from everybody. Thanks very much, um, Guy. I think at this point I'll hand back to you for the next audience question. Yeah, thanks, Ray. I just echo that. Absolutely great observations on, the, on that topic. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, now, we have another question in from the audience, and this one's on security. So, Don, let me, uh, let me address this one to you. 
The question is, what are the security aspects of Open RAN when considering its interoperability? Because every functionality may run as network functions with open hardware and software components and open interfaces. So I guess, you know, our, our um, audience members just want to know more about the security implications of this. Yeah, security is a big topic. We could probably have our, I don't know, a separate panel discussion on security and, and bring uh, experts in from Dell and others on, on that. I'll say, um, you know, security across hardware and software, um, you know, there's many different areas to touch on here. So um, in the hardware side, right from the security of the supply chain to how you're securing your, your hardware, um, uh, needs to be considered when you're developing it. So when we're bringing uh, COTS solutions to OpenRAN, um, that security is embedded in our in our development processes. And in touching around the software and open interfaces, you know, I'll say openness and interoperability, that doesn't inhibit secure solutions. So we'll have um, security being explicitly defined and it's, a difference it's not being clouded or uh, obscured by proprietary protocols so just like in cots hardware is a foundation for oran security techniques and tools do exist and oran will be expected to embed these as our solutions uh, mature um, so i think it's a topic that's going to be continued to discuss and i think we're going to end up with a security architecture that um, is better than what we see now yeah, th thanks very much, Don. You know, we've had this um, this this point of view or this this opinion for a number of years now, haven't we? About open interfaces surely must inhibit security, uh, you know, must must compound security problems. But the other the way of looking at it is means we can actually delve into into the um, into the infrastructure, the APIs, and see what's what's going on there. Uh, and as you say, we could have an entire panel dedicated to the subject. We probably will in our next summit. Uh, uh, Volker, let me come across to you first for some uh, additional comments on security. I, I would say the security issue is not bigger than with normal computers. You know, with normal computers, you're also running um, different software packages on a computer, and, and you also need to make sure that this computer is safe, and, and, and you need to, to install gateways and, and, and firewalls and stuff like that just, just to make it happen. But, but uh, I think the, the challenge is not bigger than, than this one. Thanks, Volker. Well, you know, the security issue is one of the um, answer options we've got in the poll that we're running this week. Uh, so we'll see in, in a few minutes time whether our audience think that that's an area that the industry should be focusing on in the next 12 months. So you give us uh, five or 10 minutes and we'll take a look at the, uh, the poll results. But in the meantime, I think we'll um, hand back across to Ray for our next question. Okay, thanks, Guy. Uh, and for this next question, uh, we'll come to uh, Andy first. And the question is, um, in his interview, uh, Neil McRae from BT said that OpenRAN isn't really delivering any more, any more vendor choice for operators and that the technology is all still pretty much the same. Is OpenRAN giving operators more choice or not? Uh, so this is a, a question that's come from uh, a one-to-one -one interview that was held uh, with Neil McRae and, and he's not uh, convinced he's seeing an awful lot more differentiation as a result of open RAN developments. Uh, Andy, what, what's your view on this? Uh, uh, are we starting to see some, you know, additional options coming in for operators? Yeah, I think absolutely, because if I look today at the number of vendors that I'm engaged with in, in terms of the hardware platform, you know, I think the last time we ran an RFI several months ago now in terms of, of radio hardware, that RFI went out to 20 different vendors. We had at least 16 different vendors responding to it. That would ne never have happened with, you know, with our incumbents in the past, that there weren't so many. Similar also in terms of, of the compute platform, what we're seeing there is a transition from highly proprietary uh, baseband implementations to, to, to platforms running on, on general purpose processing today, predominantly x86 and in the future, potentially also ARM based solutions. So the choice is there. There's probably a, a fair point coming, I think, in terms of the maturity of some of that technology um, and, and readiness to, to be deployed. But, you know, for me, 
the very straightforward answer would be that we've we've just launched um, deployment of our first commercial network in the UK, um, and, and I don't think we have any of the existing vendors in in that combination. Um, so we've got new vendors in all areas, from from radios through to to the baseband uh, and, and the CAS platform there as well, as well as the RAN software vendor. So so clearly operators today do have more choice, uh, and I think over the next 12, 18 months, as we get more commercially hardened solutions from many of the other vendors out there, then, yeah, that choice will continue to grow and will run through, no doubt, further RFP activities and, and the opportunities to bring new vendors into, into commercial networks will be absolutely there. So I think it depends how you choose to look at the market and what perhaps specific sector you might focus in, but generally we see you know, a very strong ecosystem now for, for Open RAN. And, and more importantly, I think over the last 12 months, we've seen two things really change. One has been the engagement with silicon vendors um, of all shapes and sizes from some of the very biggest silicon vendors in the world now actively working with us to, to develop silicon solutions. Um, and then also significant players, you know, such as, as Don and, and Dell there um, coming into the market where previously they, they wouldn't have been. So uh, I think there is um, significant change happening and, and more recently increased interest also from hyperscalers, no longer just in the mobile private network space, but also looking to expand out into macro areas. So, yeah, I think no choice has you know undoubtedly been increased for operators um, and it's all still promoting you know open platforms and, and open RAN. So for us now, I think we're in a very good position and, and as I say, I think, yeah, absolutely, there is more choice. Okay, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, okay, I think at this point, uh, I will hand back to you, Guy, for the uh, next part of the programme. Yep, thanks, Ray. Uh, we can't wait any longer. We've got to check in on the audience poll because, as promised earlier, uh, we need to have a look at our audience poll for this year's Open RAN Summit. One question, seven answer options, and you can pick whichever ones you feel are the most important. The question we've been asking is, which of these are the most important areas of focus for the Open RAN community during the next 12 months. And you can see the real time votes right here. Now, don't forget the numbers indicate the percentage of respondents who selected each option. And that's why they don't add up to 100. So for example, we can see here that leading the scoring at the moment, total cost of ownership models for commercial deployments, 54% of respondents of voters have specified that TCO is an important area to focus on. If I scan down that list there, security measures, mentioned security earlier, security measures in open run architectures coming in currently at 45%. I have to say that is quite a, quite a close field for most of them, maybe less so for the, um, the ecosystem uh, the developer ecosystem market there for X apps and R apps. Perhaps that will come a little bit later than these uh, next 12 months. Now, if you have yet to do so, please vote because the more votes we get, the better. But don't delay because we are closing the polls first thing tomorrow morning. Right, we are back to our Q&A. Uh, we're about 30 minutes into the program now, so we still have time to answer a few more of your questions. So let me hand it right back over to Ray. Okay, thanks, Guy. And yeah, uh, great responses there to that poll. And interesting to see that there's clearly a lot of areas that people believe uh, need to be uh, focused on intently uh, in the uh, in the coming months. So uh, 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 really interesting results there. Um, so the next question from our audience, Volker, we're going to put this one to you first. And the question is, are interfaces between elements fully standardized as per ORAN Alliance architecture and specifications? Um, so I guess, you know, the, the, the question is, you know, how far down, how mature is the current uh, uh, open RAN ecosystem in terms of following ORAN specifications and enabling real interoperability? Uh, so Volker, what, what's your view here? 
Yeah, I think the, indo uh, the industry is working hard to, to get all these uh, interfaces standardized. Uh, there's still some room for interpretation, but, but uh, the overall working groups are working in fixing this stuff. So, so we are on a, go a good way. And uh, I think we are more advanced as uh, 3GPP in, in this open run uh, for now, because 3GPP uh, leaves a lot of interfaces undefined. And, and that's, of course, um, um, even more uh, uh, problematic. But, but I think we are on a good way. OK, yes. And of course, there are uh, uh, a lot of interfaces to to be uh, specified uh, and worked on. Uh, Andy, what's your view from the operator perspective? Um, uh, are, are things progressing as you need? Uh, and uh, you mentioned earlier that, you know, maybe an acceleration of, of this kind of work would help. Yeah, I mean, I think we're in a, we're obviously in a good place today because we've, we've, we've launched our first commercial deployment. We wouldn't have done that if we weren't confident that, that interfaces and such things were, were ready. But, um, you know, much like, you know, ORAN is, is going to, Open RAN is going to continue to be a, an evolution um, as we, we, we advance those platforms, um, as we take on new functionality, as we define, you know, new services for, for our customers and wanting to ensure that, that our customers get the best possible experience. Um, we want to, to take these products, you know, there's, the question is how open is an interface? So, so we could spend all day talking about that. So I'm not going to go down that path, but, but you know, an open interface doesn't necessarily mean that you've got full interoperability, for example. We'd like to get to the point in many instances where we get much closer to plug and play. So that would really simplify many aspects of, of our commercial network deployments. If we get to the point of plug and play and, and also having that in a multi-vendor interoperable um, platform, then, you know, probably happy days and, and a lot of work has been done. But there's an awful long way for standards to go yet. Um, we, we've got very good foundations through through the work that, that, that we've done and, and vendors have done and everybody that's contributed into to the ORAN Alliance work. But just as 3GPP continues to, to exist today and is absolutely essential for the industry, then I think ORAN will continue to, to, to also have its it's par parallel and, and completely complementary track to ensure that these open RAM platforms um, support the 3GP technologies of today and the future. This is this is the point that, that Vulcan made earlier. What we're really looking at here in terms of open RAM is the platform. It's then the technology that it supports that comes from 3GPP. So together, we need to continue the work. We need to continue the commitment to, to, to both the organizations, but most importantly in ORAN, keeping very close to our original ethics of maintaining those open interfaces and and not making perhaps sometimes because we're pressed by commercial pressures or deployment pressures um, to make decisions where we accept something that isn't quite as we want it to be. For this to be a success, we need to get it completely right. Um, and and the, I think a really hot example at the moment is where we start to see um, the alternative architectures coming into to the baseband area with inline acceleration. Um, which, which as an operator potentially could bring cost and, and benefits and, and more efficiencies to the compute, but brings us some challenges today because the, the standards don't exist to ensure that we could have any accelerator working with, with any compute platform. And, and then we start to, to be taken down a potentially a, a proprietary vendor route in terms of the accelerator. The accelerator then potentially ties us with a commitment to a particular software vendor who has to develop their software stacks to match the accelerator. So this isn't a path that clearly we want to follow. Uh, and again, this is something that we're working hard in WG6 with a number of other operators and other, a number of, of vendor partners as well. Um, we need to move that progress in, in WG6 forwards as quickly as possible so that we can get these, these, these new alternative um, compute platforms in place, so that we have more options and, and, and choice in the marketplace. But we don't want to do that if we end up being tied to, to a proprietary interface within the compute platform. So that's the level that we're now moving to. It's not just about interconnectivity between the key components, such as the compute and the radio head. We've got the ORAN specification 7.2s, for example, doing that today. But now we're beginning to look at, at interfaces within inside the components, within inside, inside those key building blocks, which could inevitably end up again tying us to, to a particular vendor. And, and then we lose the broader ecosystem and we lose all the benefits of the open RAM platform. So we're working hard to avoid that. 
And, um, you know, I'd encourage other operators and vendors to, to support us on that journey because otherwise we will start to see market fragmentation. And, and in the long term, that can only be a damaging thing. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Andy. And of course, you know, uh, plug and play, uh, you know, would be the, the nirvana, I, I guess, here. Uh, but still very early days uh, for, for open round development. So uh, a lot of work to do. Um, and, you know, that's why we're talking about this now. That's why there's so many questions uh, coming in from the telecom TV community about this. So thanks so much for those insights. Um, guys, so, and as we mentioned, questions still coming in, uh, even though we're well into this program. So let me hand over to you for the next one. Yep. Thank you, Ray. Uh, this next question, I, I think this next question has come in as a result of the interview we did with uh, with Vodafone, with Luthia at Vodafone about the RIC. Um, it's a RIC based question. Don, um, I think I'll, if I can come to you for, for this question, the question is, how do you see the RIC being a competitor to RAN scheduler algorithms uh, in the longer term? Uh, a technical question there from our audience, uh, focus on, on the RIC. Uh, have, you, have you got any thoughts about this one? Yeah, so we don't see the RIC being a competitor to uh, embedded RAN scheduling algorithms. Um, the RIC allows for customization and tuning um, of, of the solution. So um, for an operator, um, whether it's a public uh, macro network or even an operator of a private uh, open RAN um, solution, the REC will allow you to optimize um, for your needs. You're not going to be dependent on getting um, that into the roadmap of a single RAN vendor um, uh, software. So, you know, to take it a little less technical, um, the analogy you often hear is think about our, our, our modern day cell phones. If we were dependent on every application being developed by that phone manufacturer, um, you would think that would be ridiculous. So the REC will allow, you know, whether it's a scheduling algorithm or other uh, applications to be deployed for, um, for the benefit of, of the operators and for vendors, uh, software ran software vendors, you know, they're free then to innovate in, in their areas of strengths. So this is not a competitor to what will be delivered by um, uh, in the scheduling algorithms. Great, great answer, Don. Thanks for clearing that up for us. Um, and you know, this, this really gets to the heart of the philosophy of, of Open RAN, what Open RAN's all about. Um, okay, uh, I think we should hand over to you, Ray, because I think we we'll probably get get another question. We've just about got enough time on today's program, so over to you, Ray. Okay, thanks, Guy. Uh, yeah, we're we're running towards the end of the program, but uh, we do have a couple of minutes left to squeeze another one in, so. Uh, Volker, let's come to you first with this next question. Uh, and the question is, for the massive rollout of Open RAN, the transport network options for open front hall and centralized CUDU will need to be upgraded. Does the panel have any, uh, any experience with other transport options such as XGS PON or 10G PON? And what would be the TCO impact of such investments? So uh, really about the sort of the, the supporting transport infrastructure here to enable, uh, you know, these uh, near real time communications and, and the kind of automation uh, that uh, the open run architectures are, are promising. Uh, so uh, Volker, any insights here on, on how the, 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 the supporting transport network is developing to support open run? So Basically, I would say Open Run does not need a different transport, transport network uh, as, as any other um, or, or non-Open Run technology because on the front wall, we typically use a fiber. Um, that, that's the same now with uh, 4 or 5G. So typically you have fiber between uh, the, the baseband unit or the, the control unit and, and the radio. Um, so, so that will be the same. Uh, and the backhaul um, is depending on what kind of, of data traffic you have from a radio side. So, so it really depends um, on what kind of technology you, you use or, or need to use there. It could be also fiber, but, but also other technologies. 
What, what is uh, important from um, a um, transport technology is, of course, capacity and latency. So, so if GPON is um, um, supporting the latency and, and, and the capacity, then, of course, it could be used. But, but one thing I, I, I want to make clear, there's, um, you can run open run on a classic setup. So where the baseband unit is sitting next to the radio on the radio side, but you can also run it virtually. Uh, but, but this is also possible uh, with some OEMs um, current hardware. And it's always, um, a, um, uh, a kind of a TCO um, 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 consideration that what do I do? Do I keep the baseband next to the radio on site or do I put uh, the baseband somewhere in a, in a base station hotel centralized? Then, of course, I, I typically need to run a fiber uh, from the base station hot hotel to, to the front hall because um, as said, um, the radio does need um, um, fiber. Um, and Open Run is using EC Pre as uh, currently uh, as, as a physical layer, as currently all uh, radio technologies in 5G are using. So, so there's not too much difference. Okay, great. Thanks, Volker. And of course, you know, there's there's kind of lots of different permutations about how the uh, actual uh, physical elements that need to be connected, how they're going to be uh, distributed. So, um, you know, lots of things to consider. And I'm sure many operators are going to have, you know, different answers to meet their own requirements there as well. Um, so uh, thanks uh, for that response, Volker. And of course, uh, thanks for the, the question is, uh, thanks for the question as well. We've had a really good uh, array of questions, different types of questions today from the uh, from the telecom TV community. Uh, okay, at this point, Guy, I think I'm going to hand back to you. And uh, am I seeing a red light flashing in the corner of our digital studio? You are indeed, Ray. The red light is blinking rather rapidly now. So we, we are out of time for our program today. So Thank you very much to all of our guests who joined us for this live program and to our audience, the Telecom TV community, for sending in their questions. And what a lot of questions there were as well. Well, that's a wrap for the Open RAN Summit for this year. But Ray and I will return. Oh, yes, we sure will. Uh, we're taking a short break from summit season to splash on some Factor 50 and stay out of the sun, of course. And then we'll be back in September to once again delve into the cloud native world. Yes, so please join us on the 14th of September for our Cloud Native Telco Summit, the fourth year of the Cloud Native Telco Summit. And that kicks off a very busy second half of the year. We have lots of exciting programs in store for you. For now, enjoy the summer, catch up on all those summit programs you may have missed. It's an option. Thanks for watching, goodbye. The After Show was recorded in front of a live online audience. 